They come grab a chair. One of you will leave the fish bowl, leaving one chair empty for another one, uh, for someone else to come in, right? And we're going to try and seed it with different topics. So we're going to go through a bunch of different topics and just get a good feel for what people think. Fair enough? All right, what's the first topic? So I want to seed this topic, which has been in the conference theme for a while. Scrum certifications is killing Agile. So I want people to express the views. Yes, I am I'm anti-certified, anti-certification for anything. So I truly believe Scrum certification has contributed much more to the degradation of Agile than to contributing to it. Uh, while in some sense it might get started off, but it is too simplistic to start, but then we drown. Uh, so do, do I want to give that sense of comfort to people to start that, to say that you know it's fairly simple, but then not achieve, uh, achieve your goals and after that commit suicide? Uh, it's as simple as that. So people are going on the verge of committing suicides in Agile without knowing the before knowing the true value. So my last, my previous talk was about uh, not necessarily just around Scrum certification, but about the over focus on processes without thinking about how a particular process or a tech or a technique uh, adds to the business goal. And I and I worry that you know certifications sort of. Uh, uh, cement this further, this over focus on process without seeing how a particular process fits the larger goal. Well, definitely in our community we overvalue these certifications and really we know that if you want to get a lot of these certifications it's really easy. So you could get it in a year or two, just have some, uh, some money and some time, that's all. Uh, but so first, I think we should think about downgrade the value of this certification as much as possible. But also, we should think about providing some knowledge because, well, we, if we just cancel all these certification programs, we also cancel our knowledge acquisition because it's 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 important because we still see that people don't understand what agile means, and we should think about it and talk about it. I wish I did then probably I wouldn't have needed all these education and qualification that we are talking about and do two, two days and, and probably hundreds or hundred certifications and then I aggregate them to one whole value. No, I cannot do that. So uh, that's where I will desist from that. Aspect. What is the value? Is there is there anybody here also who feel that there is, there is value in the certification and you know that it's not, we shouldn't just take it off? Anybody has a differing opinion? I do feel there are uh, there there is an addition in getting the certifications. But apart from getting certifications, we have to that is a basic knowledge what we can get it from. A, though it is a two day or a one day or one day training or a one week trainings. But the basic concepts, if at all we are we can get it. We that's. We can get it from those certifications, but apart from that, what we practice, so that it's all matters how we can uh, we can practice those concepts, so that really matters. Well, I think I totally agree with that. So long as it is body of knowledge, but then why do you need a certificate for it? I need a certificate because I want to showcase it somewhere. I make a poster out of it or a placard out of it, but what's the value of that? If you remove that element, I would say probably one-tenth or 99% of them will not go and buy that placard anymore. The point is that there is a superficial element created in it and it is fostering a certain amount of commercial mechanism to it and people value that uh, to some degree and that value is incorrect in my opinion. I mean both ethically and also on a commercial line, why do we want to do that? So, somebody can Yeah, I, I disagree uh, with uh, this point that uh, you know certifications are downright bad uh, it's very easy for us to say what is wrong uh, with what is there it's very easy for us to find out uh, various pitfalls which are there no doubt but 
uh, not having it is not the solution uh, you know we need to improve so just like any other profession this is a profession and we need to take it forward and uh, certification is at least uh, to some extent there is something that uh, a company such as uh, you know who wants to start practicing agile they have heard about it there is something that they can do there is something tangible uh, by not having it they will be void so there needs to be something there needs to be uh, maybe a more uh, deeper professional two year or four year degree course or whatever or maybe uh, you know just like a chartered accountant or a doctor you might have uh, people practicing with the agile practitioner for two years before they get certified but just not having anything is not the solution no I it was an interesting story last year. Uh, I needed an agile coach uh, to hire. So I've done a lot of interviews with a lot of people, with a lot of certifications. And in the end, I hired a person without certifications at all. Absolutely. The case, the case was that uh, he had no time to get these certifications. But he, he had really extremely high knowledge, experience in agile. So I think again that, that that's that's a very clear illustration of what's happening in our industry. You know, so one thing I, I I tell people that are thinking, do I get the certification or not? Is it's one of it is completely practical. Right? There are a lot of organizations and companies, and if you want to do business with them, they it's a language they speak. Right? And the language they speak is certifications. And it's just a choice. If you want to do business with them, go get the certification and get it done so, so you can do business with them and speak their language and then just let it go. Don't think it's going to qualify you. But it's just very practical. It's very utilitarian. I just need to do business with them and that's you speak the language. I'm going to be certified so then you're going to size me up a certain way and we can talk then. And, it's, it, and I don't like it any more than anybody but that's, it's just the fact if you want to do business. Um, the other thing is there's certain, like I'm working on a certain certification now. I am in the process of becoming, we, if I pass through, uh, a certified scrum coach, right? And I'm just doing this completely for me, right? This is completely for me. If, uh, because it's a really rigorous process through pe peers I really trust. It's not going to make me more marketable, right? I was just thinking, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's the truth. Uh, 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 any Star, uh, Star Trek fans in here? Oh, God, this is total. Oh, there's one Star Trek. Okay, Star, Star Trek fans. This is like go, becoming a CSC is like running through the gauntlet of Klingon paint and sticks. Right? <laughs> That's not going to make sense if you're the Star Trek fan. But it's like the ultimate test, right? You're, you're, you're these, these people you trust are throwing this stuff at you. And when I get done, done and through it, like, it's going to feel great. Is it going to make me more valuable or smarter than anybody else? Or, you know, is it going to gain? But I would have gone through and given myself this test. And that's, that's, it's, it's one kind of certification that's valuable to me, just, just for having gone through the experience. So I'd counter that. To me, I would, I would make a very strong statement and say certificates, a certification is like tissue paper. And uh, why I say that? Uh, the reason is very, I mean, I, I would like to make a very clear distinction between the claims made on the resume uh, for graduation. Like, what, do, what does it really mean? When I look at the resume and say he has graduated and done masters or whatever, it just is a indication of sincerity of the person pursuing that degree. Beyond that, how much the depth of the knowledge that the person has acquired is to be tested when the candidate comes in. With regards to certification, we just have to leave it at that point that the candidate knows something, but the depth of it cannot be assessed. So that's why you know I say that that's what is I mean. Um, I'm coming in just a little bit late, but I just wanted to rant for a minute. Uh, years ago, I at a conference, uh, there was a, a panel discussion, a debate on certification, and no one, uh, there was a, you had to be for or against, and the people who were going to be for certifications didn't show up. Only one person showed up. So somebody said, Jeff, will you 
be on the four certification. I said, eh, I can debate anything. I can argue for it. So I'll sit on there. And I managed to convince myself it was a good idea. Um, <laughs> so the, given that, uh, the first certification I ever received was when I was 15 years old. I had to get a food handler's permit so that I could work in a restaurant, which taught me to wash my hands after going to the bathroom. Um, uh, it didn't mean that I was going to work in the restaurant and be able to be the lead chef or be good at it. I just knew to wash my hands if I peed on them in the bathroom. And, and that was about it. Um, I, you know, learning scrum in a two-day class is kind of like learning to swim from a PowerPoint deck. No one uh, thinks you can survive in a pool. And I, the only thing I can think of, look, there is a huge demand for just basic agile training, and I think the Scrum certifications fulfill that demand. I wish any other organization would have picked up and fulfilled the demand in maybe a more neutral way, but no one else has in as strong a way as they have. So that's good. Everybody gets basic certification, and I worry that sometimes that we think the, the employers that we think employers or people are stupid. I, I guess I don't think does anybody think that employers who hire people with Scrum Master Certification think that they're hiring, you know, super competent people? Do they think that, oh my gosh, they've had this two-day class, so these are, these are much better people than other people? It, I, I don't think so. I don't think we give employers enough credit. Uh, I don't think that they see the certification and think, oh, these are more competent people. Um, it's just a beginner class. It's two days worth of instruction. gives a, gives you a basic vocabulary. And I don't think anybody thinks it's you know any more valuable than the food handler's permit I got when I was 15. So that's my rant. Thanks a lot. So my take on that is I'm completely against certification, but certainly I'm not against her training. So training is an important part, and that's what we're trying to learn. With a it, but uh, if I don't, if I can interrupt you a second, what would you call a graduate of the training class? Uh, is there another word we have for certification? But like that's a, a bigger problem. That's a bigger problem. Like so a, on with Agile, what we're trying to give you a gold star on your head. Would that be enough? Or is I that wish, I <laughs> it wouldn't work in India. But, <laughs> so, but anyway. right. uh, no, so the reason with with the Agile, the kind of the what we are trying to bring in is the mindset change with the behavioral change and with certification uh, accrediting that whether the mindset has been changed, it's really tough. So I, I don't think so that certificates are going to add any value, whatever we talk about, until, unless you are actually practicing, practicing it.
perspective that was brought to the table was shot down saying, is that unique to Agile? And the speaker said no. Is this unique to Agile? The speaker said no. So I'm, I'm really curious now that what is Agile? Why, why is there such a big deal about it? Should we just kill it? It's, it's a word. Okay. It, it, in and of itself, it actually has no meaning beyond that which we give it. So, should we kill it? No, because it has meaning because we give it that meaning. But at the same time, Agile isn't as special anymore. You're right. There are other processes and frameworks that do the same sort of thing that have been for decades, really. If you look at the adoption of Agile across the world, we've won. We're no longer the the, the, the hippies and the yuppies wearing sandals and beards talking about this new fancy way of working. We are the establishment. Right? We're no longer the, the outsiders. So maybe there is a point to be said that this conference, this conference I like, so please don't this conference, but other agile conferences, this whole idea of community around something that is the establishment, maybe there is a point to be made that like, we've won. So what's next? Actually, maybe that's the question. Not should we get rid of Agile? What's next? Uh, okay. So, so I think it was uh, Anton Cheko that said that uh, happy families are all uh, alike, but unhappy families are all uh, unhappy in a different way. Uh, and I want to take that metaphor to talk about and say that why do we never ask about the same thing for waterfall? Not a single process document has ever been written uh, to codify a waterfall and, when and, and yet we all uniquely berate waterfall uh, without, ap without any standard. But yet, and, and for Agile we have like probably uh, four dozen different standards at the last count and yet we still continue to, to have that problem. I think the way to define Agile is to burn down all the standards and say this is Agile. And let's accept it that it does not have to be bottled inside single person's opinion. And, and it's just a state of mind. That's what it really is at the end of the day. We, let's un, uh, unchain it from the shackles of process, tools, vocabulary, terminologies, roles, artifacts, and what have you. You That's said state mind. of mind. It's a state of mind. So what's that state of mind? It's a state of mind that says, how do we go about solving the problems in a way that allows me to uh, metaphorically and literally represent the meaning of English word agile because that's what we have embraced. We didn't use the word stone, right? It's like uh, De Bono's word of water logic. Mm. I, I find water logic versus rock logic as a, as go a go metaphor. Go back to the state here. of mind. Yeah, it's a so, state so, of mind. So that how do you list, how do you characterize that state of mind? I, I think it's, it's like the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's the guy, if I know how I'm solving the problem. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Beauty can't be in the eye of the beholder. No, That's okay. aesthetics. I don't think I, I <coughs> need to... I, should I need to How do you know that person is agile? Can I, I, you figure it out? I think that's the point here, uh, Lance. Yeah. I'm saying that we don't have to be apologetic or defensive about telling someone else that uh, 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 all, all teams are agile, but some teams are more agile than others, right? right. We don't need to get into that uh, state of uh, uh, agility. But there's a state of mind, and there's some people in the state and some people that aren't, right? So, uh, so let's look at it this way. If I'm a six-year-old child, mm. And I've just started to learn to, to kind of get to and, and start running faster. Mm. Would I be any less agile than, some, than Usain Bolt? It, by the dictionary, you could go with physical agility, but we're talking I about don't agile really software. Quite no, I think I would, have, I would reserve the right to be agile and not being compared to an Usain Bolt who can run in 9.8 seconds. The point is, I am agile compared to what I was yesterday. And that's what to me is uh, end of the day uh, so there. So comparatively agile. Thank you. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I found when I meet people is I can find out, I have this feeling like, wow, this person would be great to work with because they have this, I think you said it, state of mind. Um, and, and a lot of the people, uh, well, after some conversation, you find out you share some background and history on how you develop software together. And, and you find out maybe they've been doing XP, maybe they've been doing Scrum, maybe they've been doing Kanban, something different. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump in and say, uh, here's how I, how I define Agile. Uh, and actually, it isn't me. It's those, those, those people that put together that document in the past, the, the Agile Manifesto. To me, that's the, the, that to me is the closest documentation of the state of mind that you're talking about. So I actually wasn't trying to create a disagreement or anything, but I was interested in if, see how you would define the state of mind and see if it would lead us to, to that. So that, that's what I do. So I talk about the Agile Manifesto. You know, I would really wonder, and I don't know whether we had waterfall coaches. 
but why do we need agile coaches right because so i, I don't know, I, I understand so, so if it was if it is a, a state of mind and it's so natural to be right and i i never know whether there's a waterfall conferences there would be, there have been some software engineering conferences i, I never heard, i don't i never never come across one i don't know it would be an information for me if i heard a waterfall conference uh, right so it, it's been all uh, done for some sense of economy right it, it's what, like any other uh, religion it, it's a religion now more than anything else uh, i'm very much pro agile and since there was no waterfall coaches that's why there are agile coaches if there would have been like there was uh, waterfall coaches then there will not be any problem and we were not here as the agile coach i'm very much pro agile agile is a treatment what i think it is because we all have all the companies is having diseases and agile is a kind of treatment and whether you are going to solve that disease with uh, medicine like karma medicine like scrum medicine like dsdm it depends upon the doctor so who is, is, it, who is taking the is treatment is it fair to say that agile is required for dysfunctional teams and good good teams don't need agile no i always believe in because you're saying continuous it's, improvement it's there to cure disease right i mean that metaphor breaks down very See, badly uh nareesh what i feel is if your company is doing waterfall and they are doing the delivery they are happy their customers are happy why do you need agile at that time you don't need agile because you are happy with your that model but why agile comes into the picture because when you have some problem and the word agile the first round i heard being agile word agile is a noun agile is adjective agile is uh, uh, like it depends how you put it into the sentence it gets its beauty when you put that agile word as adjective in a sentence as a noun in a sentence and that's my point that's why i put my company name agile plus <laughs> thank you you know i really don't know why we are arguing so much and so intensive about this thing because for me it's quite obvious how to define are your team agile or not so i've done a very simple uh, exercise a lot of times i just put all values and principles on the pair paper grab the team ask them to put green stickers if they think that they are doing that's uh, something that is correlate to these principles and values and red stickers that something is not correlate and strange but after this exercise some teams were happy after leaving the meeting room and some not and it was obvious do they agile or not So, uh, you know, while somebody said that uh, there are no waterfall coaches, but we always had CMM consultants and we always had RUP consultants, right? Uh, I think to me, agile is actually, uh, you know, it's not a state, but it's a behavior. It's a moment. And uh, probably one thing which is really unique about this whole agility is uh, in this conference itself, you know, you can see that people are really killing their own agile, so-called agile practice, right? they are constantly you know uh, questioning you know whether is this really working and you know killing it and kind of improving it or uh, you know uh, sort of innovating it uh, that's that's really the cool thing about this moment and uh, i think that is what binds us all thank you thank you so for me more than practices agile is a more about being and the passion we all carry of uh, that state of being uh, like being healthy everybody may have different idea about their their health and them being healthy i think the passion every one of us today being saturday 6 pm we all are in the room that's a passion uh, for agile i think and maybe a round of applause for all of you guys for being here on saturday 6 pm right. so it's not about the question about whether we believe in agile or not i think the discussion is about you know how uh, we consider when we want to improve our agility so there are different ways and means to be there practices processes may come and go your team might adapt a practice today and tomorrow they may find practice b better than better than a for their context th this will keep changing be, uh, being agile way of being 
I think that that's a, a philosophy and that will stay there. Yeah. I think uh, I would like to speak uh, uh, being a pro uh, agile and uh, I would like to you know define in a single line. It's a very effective uh, software methodology which can become very fragile if people don't take it in the right sense, in the right frame of mind. Mm. All right, so I'm glad this question came up about what, what the word is, right? Because um, it's something that I think India and people in India can actually answer better than, than, than the place where the word originated from, right? Because somebody said, what's, you know, agile and it's this English word, right? And English is a horrible language, right, for this kind of thing. It's the language of politicians, right? combined with this Western need to understand and dissect and rationally be able to understand things rationally. And we're sitting here in the land where, if you, if you allow me to get mystical for a bit, we're the land, you know, we're the land where God appears in hundreds of thousands of forms, right? And I, I'm reminded that I, I go down, I've, I've traveled to this, this mountain in Tamil Nadu called Arunachala. It's a holy mountain, and so at some point, Swam Swamiji went and he said he documented over 100,000 places where you could get darshan from the mountain. And each one would have a different effect. Right? But I don't see anybody going down there and getting certified whether their darshan was appropriate in all 100,000 places. Okay? <laughs> okay. Because it just is. People, it, it just flows. I go there and I'm in the flow of people, right? And there's, so this is kind of where I really look to the answer from here, right? Be with, you, you, you know, you have such a way in, in India living with chaos and ambiguity and not needing right not needing to know agile and not needing to know have, have the certification that there's a lot there's so much that's why it's been such a blessing to be here in the last year that there's so much you can bring to the world especially because there's so many software developers here and more and more and more and there's a lot you can bring to the world on this all right well thank you for this perspective I would ask, I will just request everyone to think from one different perspective, um, being from psychology background. As I'm hearing this terminology since last four days, you know, agile is a mindset. It is there to increase visibility. So do you mean the visibility were not there in waterfall? Some, but the degree, nobody knows. And when you implement agile, what's the degree? Okay, it, it, is, it depends on the conditions. It's not standard all together. But let's take a step back and think about mindset, All right, which means a very big word, mind. Do we understand it? What is mind? When we think, okay, you know what? Mind has different categories. It is conscious, subconscious, unconscious. Conscious is just 10%, which you can correlate by just focusing on words, because you can focus on words consciously. But subconscious? Excuse me, if it is something subconscious, how you can control it consciously? Superconscious, forget about it. Nobody knows it. Everybody's trying to still figuring it out. But still, it's the whole mind set, a set of conscious, subconscious, and unconscious or superconscious. All right. Now, about individual mindset of all these three dimensions. When people try to see how they are, they look in the mirror. And this year, you know what? This is my reflection of physical appearance, conscious things, and I can control it consciously. Subconscious, I still need someone else to tell me how am I. Maybe some mentor, guru, coach. When we have a team working towards a common goal with individual mind, with three different dimension, and obviously it becomes very complex and chaotic. That's where chaotic theory comes from to reflect upon the actions of a team as, a, as an organization or as an individual. And that's why we need coach to have neutral reflection and visibility and let the individual decide what they need to do. And that's why it is facilitation. And that's why we call, you know, that's why we have books like skill facilitator or team builder who does not guide it. They just help in reflections. So this is just one perspective and it's like, oh, you, if you can tell me how mango tastes, oh, how mango tastes, okay. How about having mango lassi? How about having mango milkshake? How, how about having mango? How about having alfonso or some other varieties? All right, so it's, it's just a perspective. 
that's it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll answer shortly by uh, this. So uh, first thing is uh, Agile is uh, for me is a collection of good people. So they want to help everybody else in the world and without uh, uh, asking for too much of price. So I'd like this, uh, this to be continued without asking. The good people will keep doing what they feel is relevant for the rest of the world. They feel they have the onus to uh, help everybody in the world with whatever knowledge they have and that's why they are good. And I, I'll again uh, close it by saying, Agile is nothing but for me a good people. And as uh, Snowdown said, so it's uh, willing to learn, willing to adapt, willing to uh, learn as a new language, somebody willing to have uh, adapt. Thank you. I, I, I hope that will uh, answer the next question as well. Um, I'm actually up here for 30 seconds, because I'd like to hear from people who aren't speakers. Um, some of the attendees who are feeling a little bit brave because it's actually not that scary come up and answer the question. So, um, sorry, my voice is a little too high. So, this is the first time I'm coming to this conference. I had I heard about it somewhere about November, December. I started following it and um, uh, basically enrolled it pretty late. But at the same time, something that, I, it, that struck me is that uh, it's been growing over the years. And um, something that I would like to see next year, I'm definitely coming next year. So uh, I'm new to Agile. I'm just getting to know it and getting to see it and feel it. And we just started this Agile methodology in our organization. So next year, uh, probably I want to see um, more beginners come in and share whether it worked, whether it didn't work, and why it didn't work, and how we can improve it more. You know, and um, probably more of sessions like this where um, people who are uh, really well versed in it can suggest how this can improve. More, more, more question answerish kind of a discussionist session rather than just having people talk and people listen. Um, it, like people said, it's a mindset, and the way co people comprehend is different. So uh, basically, question answer to your question: How we can improve it will also be the same, you know. So uh, every year, if we do do have more ses sessions where people um, uh, describe what they understood out of the sessions, would improve uh, understanding agile more. OK, uh, for me, this was the first time that I've uh, taken part. It was really great, and I like the last sections of the day, basically, where we have this discussion. I think this is what is bringing it lively. And uh, one more, uh, going one more step ahead, what I want is not for the next year already, if you have some sort of a community where we have a lot of great people coming in here, and there are a lot of people coming in for the first time, for them to reach out, understand the content, and something new that's happening in the community, we should keep this community alive, and for us, to uh, go back and keep checking on what is happening around. I think that is something that I would look forward for. And if you can incorporate this information well in advance for participants to come in, uh, I think we have speakers introduction sessions, but a little more on the community. If you have a global community, for example, uh, I don't know, where do we find more information on these topics? Because there were a lot of sessions, and I'm pretty interested to attend many of them. If I get to know a little more on a few of this topic, uh, that will be really great, I believe. I al <coughs> Sorry. So, um, you know, I also joined uh, this session for very first time. So, uh, but I'm not new to Agile. I mean, I'm following uh, various projects on Agile and, you know, done it for four or five years. Um, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, the views out here because, you know, I started with normal SDSC model and delivered a lot of projects uh, using normal waterfall model as well. So some of the uh, things that have been said, uh, you know, quite contradicts in the sense that I've seen it, right? So, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, in, in last 14 years, I delivered around 10 projects uh, overall. Um, seven of them were uh, waterfall at that point, and uh, I, I can't recollect any failures. Uh, then, you know, we, we moved into the Agile, I think, 2007 somewhere. 
delivered three projects. Uh, one of them, I can say it's a bit of a failure, two are not. So, I mean, if, if you just go by data, right, uh, you know, it's, it's not about, I mean, for me, practically speaking, I, I know a lot of people have said a lot of different things and uh, possibly, you know, uh, very good things in, 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 but, you know, as per data, I mean, uh, what I believe is, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's a team, right, which, which matters more. Uh, and then you supplement that team with the right practices to be successful. So, I mean, what I would like to see here next time around probably is, uh, you know, to, to have uh, some real data in, in terms of where uh, even after applying Agile, certain things have failed. Because, you know, throughout this, con con you know, sessions, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of good things in Agile uh, and obviously there are, that's why we are all here, right? But, you know, uh, anything will have the other side as well, right? And I mean, if you bring that other side, it will probably help all of us to learn from that side and not to repeat the same mistakes. So that, that's the only feedback. Uh, this is Venkat from Fidelity Investments. And I'm also coming, uh, taking part in the conference for the first time. Um, probably if you ask me that what would be uh, you know, better for the next year conference, I would say we need a use cases uh, based material. Like, you know, whether Agile sucked their project, it screwed up their project, or what was the positivity on that particular, when they had this particular methodology applied. I think that's very, very important. I think uh, whenever we have uh, speakers coming in and giving a presentation, everybody talks very highly about Agile. Nobody says that it's true, right? I think, but at the same time, the question came when we had this session saying that why Agile? If, if, if Agile was not there, I think the question should have been asked, right? So I would think that when you bring in the different perspectives, specifically the projects uh, specific to, you know, by applying uh, agile practices, what made project more better or, you know, were they able to create innovative products and, you know, things like that at the same time, the uh, negative aspect as well. If we could, you know, give it in a, you know, in a proper, uh, you know, bucket, I think it, it makes more sense. Hi, this is uh, Ganesh again from Fidelity. Uh, what I would like to have, like, bring back one of the good things that we had been doing. This is the third time I'm coming over here. Um, we used to have, I think a couple of years ago, uh, we used to have ad hoc sessions that uh, actually participants can actually put together, can have 15 minutes, 20 minute sessions on the breakout area, and they can bring up any question that they have in mind or any practical problems that they have, have a small discussion and get things answered or share their ideas if they are doing something good. So that, that's something that I missed uh, this time. I would like that to come back. Um, so, so like him, it's my third year as well. So I've been coming here for like three years now. So I just believe that Agile is doing like, just do it and then just go on with it. So if you ask me personally, one thing I would like to see in the conference is uh, more deliberate practice. I mean, a lot of practice and a lot of workshops where I'll do something and learn something. I mean, personally, I'm not a great fan of talks. Uh, it's good. It's good to hear. But I feel that I can actually read the PPT also. I would really like to do something, small learnings, but mostly workshops and deliberate practice session. That's what I look at. Hi, I am Lakshmi Kant. I have been coming here since 2007, since uh, Naresh introduced me to Ajay. Uh, it was the first session when he introduced me. And uh, I then had a war within myself, whether I should do Agile or whether I should follow the SDLC me method. The only way I could uh, overcome it was I found in a report by the person who, invent who got the waterfall method. I read through the report and where he himself mentioned that, you know, it's not good for large projects. So that's when I decided that, okay, wherever I can, I would scrap that and I'll go for one of the Agile methods, whatever that case may be. So since then, I've been following uh, Agile methods maybe discre discreetly in my projects. So one of the things that I would lo really love f to happen from uh, in future is that this conference is spread more towards students where they are actually looking, where they can learn more about agility before they come onto the job. It becomes valuable for them. And also have more workshop for people who are already knowing most of the stuff. They can have uh, experience report and they can attend more on engineering practices, which are really hands-on. So that would add more value to all kind of audience. 
And I want to say one thing. Naresh, you have been organizing excellent conferences since last so many years. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to try and ask what I want next year, right? Uh, people have said all of these things. Now, who brings these things to the conference? Should I bring them? Should TV bring them? Should Ravi bring them? We have an open submission system. Right? If you want to talk about a failure study, please come and present. We've never rejected a proposal which talked about a failure study. In fact, I remember the first year you put in a proposal. It was about a project failure, and it was readily accepted. We said, we want more of this. We don't want agile dogma. Right? There are n number of projects failing miserably because of badly implemented agile. I'll use that word. Whatever it means, I still don't know. Right? Uh, so turning the question back, right, answer, or rather answering my own question, what do I want next year at the conference? I want more submissions from people who are real practitioners. I think we need to cut down on the consultants. We've had an overdosage of consultants selling snake oils, you know, trying to, to say how wonderful this is. But the problem is I could say whatever I want. The, at the end of the day, we need proposals coming in. Or where do we get the speakers from? Right? So turning the question back to you guys. A uh, few other things I heard. We want more of open space kind of sessions. Uh, last year there were last year we had few open space sessions. Before that we had few open space sessions, and I think we had most of them with four or five people. Is it is it justifiable to have a hall left open to four or five people? So, so those are some of the hard questions we have to deal with, right? While we want more participation, it is not we stopping. It is what we see and we reacting to it, right? So. Uh, let TV jump in. No, I, I agree with you, Naresh, and uh, I just want to chime in that we actually would be more than happy to hear about honest confessions of people, what they tried and what didn't work out for them. Uh, we literally beg and plead all of you to actually uh, tell people to come with those stories because that's what I think is the real value there. I even want to make one more uh, proposal, and I just want to request all of you for a quick show of hands. Would that format be good? Uh, just taking a segue from what you said about the consultant speak. Uh, so I, th I think as a practitioner, I would like to see a talk in which there is no PowerPoint. There is only a whiteboard and people actually come and talk on a whiteboard and actually explain what they have done, whether it worked for them or not. Because when you take away uh, the, the whole PowerPoint equation, people are suddenly more honest about what they want to communicate. So I just want a quick show of hands. Do you think that kind of a session would be good? I mean, I would be a big fan of such a session. So I think that's keep your hands up. Thing. Keep your hands up. <laughs> How many of you are willing to put a proposal? All right. All it right. is on camera. Okay. <laughs> right. Big hand. Thanks, all of you. We look forward to getting your proposals. It is on camera. We will really look forward for those proposals. how to go about submitting the proposals. So basically, if, if you ever attended a conference since 2005, you get spammed by me, rule number one, because it's all in the database. Every time we run a conference, we send out an email to all the participants who attended in the previous year saying, hey, registration's open, uh, call for proposal open, uh, whatever, right? And basically, there is a link which you can go in, create your profile, and submit a proposal. Uh, it's People have said it's good, it's bad, the submission system, some like it, some don't like it, but we have one. And it's transparent, it's open, right? It's basically anyone and everyone can go put in a proposal. There are no limitations. Each person gets three proposals, gets to put three proposals. Uh, we limit each person to put three proposals because we don't want uh, you know, someone like me just hogging the program, right? So we try to limit three proposals, and there is an open voting so people can vote for the session. Uh, I know 100% of those are gamed, which is fantastic. 
uh, we don't look at just those numbers. Uh, I think we've grown a little smarter than that. But what we look at is, is that topic of interest to people, right? So you can go and vote for a topic saying this is of interest. That does not mean that particular proposal will get selected. It just gives us a feedback in terms of, okay, these topics are interesting. And then there are comments people can leave on the proposal asking for clarification, asking for start a dialogue over there, right? So learning can start even before you come to the conference. It will help the speakers refine the proposal because they will understand, okay, this is the kind of stuff people are looking for, so let me refine the proposal to suit that, right? And so when we started this year, I, you know, I can talk about some massive failures we had in this year's conference. I think this was one of the worst conferences we've run since we've started in 2005. Uh, Last year we had a committee, we had a fairly uh, big size committee which, which ran the conference, so we had a lot of people selected beforehand and that committee was assigned to different stages and they would select proposals, give feedback. I think in the end maybe six or seven people ended up working out of the 30 people, so that was very frustrating. Everyone wants their name up there but very little contribution. So this year we took uh, opposite stand and we said let's experiment, let's try by not selecting a committee. So there is no committee to start with, right? There is a submission system, people can go put in proposal, and then if you think you can help the speaker improve the proposal by giving feedback, you start getting points as you do that. And then you have a leaderboard, so people who have given more feedback start showing up. And then we started approaching those people saying, hey, you've helped, so can you come be part of the committee? Because you actually, we see you actually contributing, right? And we see that you're doing good uh, feedback to speakers. Uh, this was the idea, which failed miserably. Uh, I don't think we really had many contribution in the end. We basically piggy banked on the six, seven people that helped us last year, and somehow we we barely managed to put the program together. Uh, this, I think, we put the program together about a month ago. The final program was announced a month ago, and a lot of it was to do with lack of support. Right? We didn't have enough support to be able to review the proposals, to go through that, and it's just, it's just a lot of work. I don't know if you guys uh, have run conferences, but the amount of work that needs to go in to select a speaker, uh, it's tremendous amount of work, and we need community support to do that. Right? So I, I know I'm you know, complaining and rambling, but uh, while we all want this conference to get better, I think we all can pitch in and do a little bit to make this better. I mean, we're not saying put your money in and if there are losses, you take the loss, right? We're not asking for that. We're saying put a little time to basically give feedback. Uh, put your own proposal. Eat your own dog food. We all put our proposals because we want to eat our own dog food. We want to see what kind of feedback actually we are getting. Some people completely derail you on the proposal system, right? And we have to keep those things in check. But anyway, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on and you know I, I'm sure all of you want to help. It's maybe failure on our part not to be clear in terms of how you can help, right? So we'll try and communicate those. There are blogs that we have written in terms of how you can help. Maybe we'll try and point more and more people to those blogs to help, help us run this conference in future. Sorry. I don't want something from the next conference, but I want something from this conference that maybe will help the next one. So if we will have some kind of a feedback form uh, system or something like this, because now just few of us really speak here. And maybe we will just put our voices all at the others. So I think it would be interesting to hear from everyone. So I, I take an extreme stand on that, and uh, I, I, by all means, I'm ready to be proven wrong, but I think feedback is bullshit. I take an extreme stand on that. Uh, why I make that statement is that, you know, if you're not in the context and you want to give feedback, I think it doesn't mean much, uh, right? You have to be in the context to give feedback. When I came, I said, oh, the AC was not good, or I didn't have a chair to sit. We see that, we know that. I don't need feedback on that, right? Or we don't need feedback on that. Uh, this speaker was not good. Inevitably, we get that feedback, but we've ran some uh, experiments. We want to give opportunity to new speakers to come and present. It's okay if some speakers did not present well, right? The projector did not show up. 
<laughs> I mean, we get all of those kind of feedback. Okay, let me correct myself. We don't. Uh, one, one more thing. Okay. Majority of the speakers who spoke this year might not come back next year. That's a trend we have seen over the years, right? So it really helps very little to say that this speaker was not good, this speaker was good. Uh, also, just because a speaker was not good last year, does that mean that speaker did not improve and is not going to be good this year? I don't think we want to be that judgmental. So there's this lot more aspect to feedback, and it has to be contextual, which is why we keep requesting that if you have some feedback, come talk to us. We'll try and give you some context around why certain things are done. So w what I'm trying to say is the extreme stand we have taken is we are not going to send a form and ask people to fill things because monkey is now on someone else's back. And that doesn't really help. Right. OK, so let me quickly correct myself. Uh, how about not to send a feedback form? How about to send a, what do you want from next conference form? Isn't that what this because is? Because you, you already asked this question. How about sending what do we want from next year, right? Uh, actually, you like it or not, people will send that email. When I go back home tonight, I will have about 500, 600 emails in the inbox saying we want this, we want this, this speaker sucked, this speaker did this. And you do get that feedback, right? Uh, so I don't know if we need the formality around what we want is people taking ownership of this conference. It is not my conference or TV's conference or X person's conference. It is our conference, right? If we are not taking that ownership, it's not going to help. It's not going to move this conference forward. If that helps, right? So next year, what do we want? I think we all will define that collectively is what my wish is. Yeah, uh, this is Baso Baso Chandrasekhar. Yeah, this time, in fact, this is the first time uh, on this conference I attended. It was pretty good, and all the sessions were also good. I, I also would like to just give a, a suggestion from next year, if possible. So, uh, if we can work on uh, an year-on-year -year, a vision-based uh, conference, so that uh, uh, people who are all attendees, maybe considering the audiences, like you know, so some of them are very first time to Agile uh, world itself, or some of the repetitive ones. This one, all the speakers were also good. So if you can uh, work on, uh, let's say, three to five takeaways from a, a specific conference on this year. So that will help us to focus uh, from the uh, talks perspective or the topics which uh, the speakers will uh, pick it up. And even for you guys also will organizing uh, to focus on those kind of uh, talks would be definitely helpful, I guess. So just in November, we did a conference in Pune and we had a specific theme for the conference. We got two proposals that fitted the theme and 180 proposals that didn't fit the theme. What do we do? So in fact, you know, so as we are running this uh, conference for like a four to five days or a one week or like this one, no? so we'll, uh, we'll see the difference from last year to this year. So okay, what was the improvement? What was there last year? and what is there here. So what is improved on this agile area? So those are the interesting topics which people would like to know. So which was already there, covered last year. So the difference has to be there from last year to this year, which is in an improvement area. So that's what I would like to see as a, and that this is what uh, the difference, and in a good way. We are progressing towards that one. So we are trying to cover up the areas which are not covered last year. And people also would like to take, OK, last year it, isn't, it, it wasn't there. And this year, I learned something. People has to feel proud of attending this one, of course. Now also it is there. But a punching uh, uh, 5 to 10 takeaways uh, uh, to be a vision-based or a focus-based would help us. I think that's no, I want to just tell, up, tell us a, a volunteering story, right? Uh, I've been uh, part of uh, these communities from uh, last 10, 10 odd years. Uh, this kind of satisfaction this gives, right? It's, it's, to, it's not to just to sell about volunteerism. It's all about the kind of learning, the kind of sharing, the kind of satisfaction we get, right? And it's important in any community. Yes, of course, we we are coming here to learn something, but we need to put something on table first. Okay. Then we can start getting. Right? So the putting something on table is what is all about, all about your. It could be your time. It could be your effort. It could be your contacts. It could be your whatever that you can put on table, right? So then it would be a meaningful thing for us to withdraw. So, so I invite all of you, you know, the, the kind of confidence which it gave to me because 
uh, I, I, I associated this forum, you know, I, I don't do agile as you know, something very special. So I practice agile in, in my projects, in my whatever I do. But the kind of satisfaction we get when we go home by, 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 you know, by talking to so many people and by, by doing at least spending an hour in a Sunday or spending an hour in a Saturday, that is tremendous. That's what I want to experience. Thank you. Hey, as a speaker, I would like to know the feedback for myself, right? Uh, if I have to improve for the next year, I need to understand where did I do well, where did I, where did I not do well. So that's what I would like to look for. The, the thing is that would people give you that feedback? Um, that's what I'm I can that. share you some feedback from past which we have done and the speakers almost discard that feedback saying it's useless. So we've, we've done a bunch of these and then we've kind of thrown away. So if there's a de better format to do it, we are absolutely willing to, to try that. Uh, I've, I've, so just to give you an example, I've had people talk about, okay, what about at the end of the session we do red, green kind of signals, right? And it's like fantastic, great idea. Now I had 20 reds and 30 greens. What do I do with that? Oh, just, yeah, just red, green is not going to help me. I need to understand the context behind it. So at least if they can go back uh, to the conference engine and they can put the replies in there, uh, indicating like, you know, whatever they felt about it, I think that would at least help me. The text would help me. The problem with that sort of feedback is it's too late. Um, uh, if they're not giving it to you straight away, there, it's, it's, a, it's a feedback based on a memory, based on a conference, based on 20 other talks. So it is not actually going to be overly valuable. And nine times out of 10, it's just going to be platitudes. Honestly, the best way as a speaker to get feedback is to talk to people after the talk and, and just be open and honest and say, hey, that was the first time I did that presentation. Can you give me some honest feedback? Did I do well? Is there something I could do better? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Just talk to people. And you might only get five or six comments um, back from people you spoke to but they're going to be a lot more valuable and you're going to be able to actually use them next time. Have you uh, done in the past or considered doing a group retrospective on the conference at the end of the conference? But to do it in a, a you know, structured manner to say this is what specifically went well, what did not go as well, what we're going to take away. collected all of that feedback, we went through the retrospective, uh, and w the next year it was a new set of people, right? So it was basically, the continuation was very hard. Uh, here maybe it's slightly different because year on our year, we are seeing more or less the same people, and even without doing the retrospective, most of those points are there in our head anyway. A lot of things go out of our control, which which cannot be done anything. Like the, the door was not closing. Uh, how would a retrospective help me next year? I mean, we've done this, but it's not helped, basically. So, I agree with Narish's point. I just did my first conference last year. Just wanted to share. I, from a retrospective, I handed a thumbs up and a thumbs down. I'm sharing a real story. Uh, when companies come, I, I come from Delhi, so it's, the agile is just propagating there, and, and I totally agree after facing it. There are groups of people who come to facilitate that it's their speakers, it happens. And the, we got thumbs down for very good speakers, and we were very embarrassed. It was a state where the speaker had spoken very well. However, there were a group of people who just, because it, they represent some organizations, it happens. So it could be a risky affair from a conference perspective, and it could be very dangerous also. The second thing what I would like to say, uh, let's not give ownership to Naresh or the team. I think it's very important for each one of us. I mean, the person who does it and takes accountability cannot sleep all night. It's very, very tough. So let's appreciate the fact any problem which happens is because of all of us. And if anything which good is happening is because of all of us. It's like an open space mechanism. So we should not say this went well. This is us. All of us are a part of here. If you don't see something is not happening, come here and contribute. 
that is that is the way it should happen. The second thing, uh, I think what we can do rather than speaking more about it because some people are not are not able to speak properly. You can have different charts attached in different areas, and then people could write on the infra and something. But let's again not be so descriptive there because people are too too smart these days. I have seen groups who behave very differently, and it really embarrasses us. I mean, that's really really challenging. So as a speaker, uh, in response to Ashish's question, I think we already have uh, the feedback mechanism in the form of Twitter stream. So I think that's a wonderful tool uh, already. If somebody tweets, you already know. If it doesn't, it's like the, the conference engine voting mechanism, right? And of course, you have the lobby talks.